He was the self-proclaimed king of all media and push the limits of what you can say. When a girl takes her pants down and you see that those panties for the first time. Oh, yeah. You never heard anything like that. You're like, what is he going to do next and how is he going to get away with it? But he battled the ghosts of childhood trauma. I was searching for that approval from my father. Took risks that nearly cost him his career. A war was set between Howard Stern and the United States of America lost millions of listeners to the competition. He switched sides. Before you know it, you are what you were making fun of. And was on the verge of being irrelevant. I don't think he assessed that risk properly. But Howard Stern is the master of reinvention. I was just a young man full of rage. Howard's just one of those guys where he goes, this is what I do and this is how I'm going to do it. And you're not going to tell me what to do. He's the greatest to ever do it. I decided to put a little post up on social media. I said, I can't tell you why I'm going to ask this question, but I want you to complete this sentence. Howard Stern is. Within hours, thousands of people started interacting with this post. Howard Stern is the most brave, a pioneer, fearless. A renegade. I, I interview many porno stars, and I'm fascinated by their lives. Misunderstood. In fact, most of the people in radio don't have any talent. Mm -hmm. The ultimate survivor. When you hire me, you hire a nut who is going to work 24 hours a day for you and never, ever burn his audience. The king of all media. I swear to you, I am a serious candidate for the governor of New York. The greatest of all time. I'm Rob Barnett. I've worked in radio, MTV, VH1, back to radio, film, online video, and juggling. Howard Stern was raised in middle-class suburban New York, but it's far from a happy childhood. He often talks about how he was relentlessly bullied at school and at home. My father, I told you not to be stupid, you moron. Stern explained to 60 Minutes how his early years shaped everything he does. It's the way I relate to the world. There's a general distrust. There's a lot of fear. There's also uh, a tremendous sense of humor, too. The legend of Howard Stern starts long ago at a radio station at Boston University. At BU, Stern hosts a weekly comedy show called The King Schmaltz Bagel Hour, but his college radio career is a short one. Fired for a clearly racist sketch called Godzilla goes to Harlem. They got your wallet. Godzilla! They got your wallet, Godzilla! When his humor doesn't land there, he tries his hand at a series of random jobs until becoming a disc jockey falls on his lap. But not just any DJ. Howard knew from the very beginning that it was what was happening in between the records that was going to drive the ratings. Breaking rules, taking risks, and creating live on-air comedy for hours every single morning was the key to standing out. He developed the shtick of being a shock jock, and it was something Americans hadn't seen before. Coming out of the 80s, most of the themes that we would see on television were based around the family. But all of a sudden, everything had a little bit of an edge, whether it was television or music or shock jocks on radio. And Howard Stern's reach was starting to grow. And as his reach grows, so does interest in his new kind of radio DJ. Sir, I say penis. I say rectum on the air. How much more leeway do you think they can give me before they all lose their license? After his edgy act gets him hired and fired multiple times, Stern turns each firing into free publicity. In New York, I was fired. I can't figure out why. But he somehow finds a pack of diehard fans who stick with him. I'm a very big fan of Howard Stern's, and I've listened to him for two years, and he's given me complete enjoyment. Stern styles himself the king of the misfits, fighting the hypocrisy of mainstream society. 
I, lo I look at the Howard Stern says anything and everything that everybody is afraid to say on the radio. You admire the man. I admire him. What you try to do is remove the microphone from in front of your face and say, you know, why don't I say what's on my mind? One of Howard's superpowers was the realization that comedy could come not just from making fun of his guests and his audience, but the comedy could come from making fun of himself. Everything down to Mr. Johnson. My parents, you said on the air, first they gave me the genes to make me six foot five with no penis to speak of. Right. Stern doesn't just talk about his own private parts. He shares intimate details about what he did with his wife the night before. I handled it like a bowling ball. Oh, boy. Stop. Fingers everywhere, Stop. even where she don't like it. I don't even want to hear this. But his college sweetheart wife tells NBC she doesn't love it, that their sex life has become part of the show. Sometimes it gets to me, it depends. You know, some certain things are exaggerated and certain things are taken out of context. But, you know, I let him have a good time with it. But what a lot of fans love most is his no-holds-barred style. What is your problem? Look, get your guys in there and fire some of these mother they don't talk to you. Hearing him yell at the people he worked with, stuff to me was like, it, it was the first reality show. When you really think about it, here's this real life scenario work that everybody can relate to. You work with somebody that pisses you off and now this guy's unloading on him. And, and you're like, I wish I could do that at my job. Everybody's had enough of somebody that they're working with. And so that I think was the basis and his honesty. The field of radio really is about a step above circus clown. He got this core group because he, he touched a nerve with them. He was relatable to them. I was listening, I was doing construction, I was, do, you know, so I'm in those plumbing vans and this is the only thing that I'm enjoying before I gotta go under a crawl space filled with spiders and, and sit there and curse my life, you know? Shuli Agar, writer, producer, on-air correspondent, and Howard 100 News reporter. He not only celebrates Misfits, he hires them as well. My name's Steve Grillo. You might remember me as Gorilla. I worked on the Howard Stern Show from uh, 1991 to 1998. I said, well, can you steam the chicken? He said, yeah. I said, fine, then steam the chicken. I was one of his favorite interns. Uh, I didn't get paid for six years. Do you keep your brain in a pail? Some people go to Harvard Medical School to become a doctor. I went to like the Harvard School of Radio with Howard Stern. So he got away with murder. He knew exactly where to stop. But like, what is he going to do next and how is he going to get away with it? They're hanging a little bit. Look, he's shooting my breast. Yeah, like, like that hasn't been done before. <laughs> it started in New York. It moved to Philadelphia, station by station, shocking the country market by market. As Stern is syndicated in cities across the country, he attracts powerful enemies in one city in particular the nation's capital. I'll tell you, it, it was it was triple X stuff. I mean, it, it's bad stuff. Uh, during the day, uh, different things that they did, it's just, it's awful, we have no place for it. Howard Stern made for the perfect foil for the Christian right. He was based out of New York. He was talking about sex. He was talking about different topics that most people never heard on the radio before. He was pushing the envelope, which brought the listeners in, the advertising dollars, but it also brought a lot of the scrutiny from other people. Under pressure from evangelicals and right-wing members of Congress, the FCC starts fining Stern's show for violating federal indecency laws. The massive success of Howard Stern's career was also marred by a constant battle and fight between his broadcast company and the FCC. The First Amendment doesn't say you have the right to free speech as long as you do it in a serious way. But he knew how to paint the FCC as a foe, almost as a bait to ask them, OK, try and take me off the air, because if you do, there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of my listeners, who will be very, very upset with you. But Stern takes to the streets, rallying the masses and other celebrities, all in the name of free speech. Let's get rid of the FCC! Every time they, they'd find him, he'd get more popular, he'd get stronger. You should be able to do whatever you want to do, tell the truth, you know? Tell him to go mess with somebody else. You should guy, get back to the absolute, uh, absolutist interpretation of the First Amendment, because pretty soon right, no one's yeah. going to be able to say anything. The crazier, the edgier, the more male that Howard Stern was, the more advertising dollars were coming in. You know, when a girl takes her pants down and you see that those panties for the first time? I was absolutely disgusted 
by the programming that involved women. Ah, all right, we're back at the lesbian dating game. To be perfectly candid, I was a huge fan of Howard Stern. But for me, at that time, I was working in media. I was working in radio. I was working in television. I understood why he needed to do that. So in my head, I could distill that type of programming because Howard Stern was a master at what he did, and really it was the interview. Unfortunately for a lot of women, they had to suffer through the programming. By the early 90s, Stern has established himself as radio's most famous rebel, but that isn't enough for him. He wants something bigger to help his career soar. September 9th, 1992. America's biggest stars of music, film, and TV are out in force. MTV Video Music Awards in the early 90s, it was the hottest ticket. It was the biggest event. It was like the event people talked about for months. Every year, when it was time to put the Video Music Awards show together, we tried to come up with surprises that would shock the audience. It's a bird! It's a plane! It's a really bad smell! A decision was made <laughs> to hire Howard Stern as Fart Man and to fly our superhero in from the rafters, farting onto the stage. <laughs> Exposing himself as Fartman at an event like that was a pretty risky move because he was introducing himself to celebrities and to Hollywood. I don't know how it was going to go over. Were people going to see it as disgusting? It could have backfired. No pun intended, but it, it, it exposed him big time. My name is Doug Goodstein, and I was the executive producer of Howard TV. I was a fraternity boy. So it's like, you know, synonymous with what, <laughs> what I was doing in college. Look at his ass. <laughs> the MTV stunt is a huge hit. But Stern's a workaholic, obsessed with fame and success. He doesn't just want to dominate the radio world. He wants to become the king of all media. He gets a TV show. Lucrative pay-per-view special. Live from and he pens a best-selling book. He even runs for governor of New York. Who do you want for governor? Vote for him before I vote for any politician. But it's a major motion picture that will cement his outrageous persona in the national consciousness. First clue up is blank willow. The only thing on my mind, Gene, was pussy. In private parts, Stern stars in his own underdog story, and audiences love it. Oh boy. You know what the truth is? I'm a dish jockey who makes $250 a week, and uh, I just want to do the right thing here on the air. I don't want to get fired. Private Parts was such a huge success, became the big, famous guy that he became. With the radio show, the book, the TV show, and the movie, Stern now has millions of diehard fans. But it's the kind of fame that also attracts a certain kind of crazy. I had to get there before Howard, which I did every day. I got up there, I thought I was going to miss Ronnie's call. Ronnie was like a little late. Ronnie was Howard's limo driver. As Stern's limo finally pulls up, a man appears on the street in a trench coat. Howard got out. At the top of his lungs, he screamed, Howard Stern, I'm gonna f kill you! Like, screaming, and he comes charging at us. Now I'm like, I'm screaming to the security guard, Shut the gate! Shut the gate! And Howard's standing like a deer in the headlights. And I'm like, get inside! Ronnie goes, go, 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 go! And Howard was sitting there and he was like, what the hell was that? What the hell was that? What the hell was that? I go, just get upstairs. Get out. Go, 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 go. Get upstairs. And I called 911. I was like, 600 Madison, come right away. Someone threatened Howard Stern's life. And by the time I got back downstairs, there was a loaded shotgun with 12 casings there. The guy was angry because Howard got canceled in Albany and he wanted to kill him. The incident pushes Stern to become paranoid about public spaces, but it doesn't mean he turns his back on weirdos. In fact, he leans into them as a key part of his show. A hundred years before YouTube, Howard Stern had a singular idea. The audience themselves could create the most unique and twisted content if he made the listeners the stars of his own radio show. 
The WAC Pack is comprised of a group of very special people with very special skills. Not like the Liam Neeson kind. I am Eric Lehman, AKA High Picture Eric from the Howard Stern Show. For someone to fit in the WAC Pack, you have to have some kind of disability. Like, it, like you have to be, you have to have like some kind of talent, like me, the, the voice I have. The 30 members of the WAC Pack become Howard Stern's most recognizable guests. The WAC Pack was a group of people that you could cold call any time of the day or night, and within 30 minutes, you have content to bring to the show. But doing outrageous stunts with mentally and physically challenged fans brings Stern more criticism. It did bother me when I saw you doing the, the guy's uh, physical deformity. Why can De Niro do it and I can't do it? I see both sides of it. Never in a million years would this opportunity come together for these people, you know? People say, hey, does it, is Howard really like that a person? I say, no. It's just for the show. He's a genuine person. And during the commercial breaks, he's a real person. And it's like he's a friend to you off the air, like he talks to you. He says, he asks you, hey, Eric, how are you? How's, it, how's everything going? But not all the Wack Pack are quirky misfits. One of the most outrageous Stern sketches was he would have this high official of the Ku Klux Klan named Daniel Carver. He had Daniel Carver do a segment where he would rate the races. And each block said, like, you know, blacks, Jews, Asians, gays. And you would see him struggling to kind of figure out which one he liked more or less. Now you're saying the goods are uh, worse than the ching and ass would be highest on the list. What it really does by putting a guy like Daniel Carver on is it shows the idiocy of, of the people involved in this. There is no question that if Howard Stern did what he did back in the 90s, now, he would be off radio in a second. Everyone would rise up against him. It would be a uniform cancellation across the board. I'm Molly McPherson, and I work with people who find themselves in the center of a media storm. Stern isn't just talking to outcasts and Klansmen. He's got celebrities and even a real estate magnet turned reality TV star. There he is, a real TV star, number one guy. Trump on the Stern Show, any super fan will tell you he's one of the best guests Howard's ever had on his show. And Howard will tell you that. Trump always went on his show and would, would banter with him and, and joke around. Wait, is oral sex important to you? <laughs> <laughs> Howard was a Republican back in the day. He, he wanted to fill the potholes in New York with uh, executed people, I believe. He, it was one of his running platforms. Trump was brutally honest. He talked about anything and everything. She's got to be doing something special. What's her secret? Well, she is terrific in bed. That was all in Howard's heyday. That was the sweet spot, if you will. I mean, that was everything. He never shied away. He was never worried about, you know, his image on the show. And neither was Howard back then. High on his own popularity, Howard Stern feels invincible. But he's about to make one of the most tone-deaf comments in radio history. April 1999, two high school students dressed in black trench coats open fire on their classmates at Columbine High School. It's America's first major school shooting and the entire country is glued to the news reports of the carnage. These were the outcast kids. Yeah, the outcasts. The kids. kids nobody liked and pushed aside. Yeah. Between 10 and 15 students who were trapped inside Columbine High School were rescued. We have to ask ourselves, what kind of children are we raising? While the nation reels, Stern goes on the air. Did those kids try to have sex with any of the good looking girls? They didn't even do that. At least if you're going to go kill yourself and kill all the kids, like, why wouldn't you have some sex? I thought I was going to kill some people. I'd take them out with some sex. When Howard made the Columbine comments, I was just like, you know, sort of taken back. And it was like, wow, that's going to give him some blowback. And that's not going to go over well. And it, and it didn't. The criticism comes in fast and furious including a resolution by the Colorado State Legislature calling on Stern to apologize. I you know, just don't know what was going through his head and how he was seeing that as extreme or an innocent comment, but certainly it wasn't an innocent comment because he got a lot of repercussions for that and a lot of blowback from that. And it was really in bad taste. Did he feel bad about some of the things he said? I'm sure he did, but 
He was this rebel. He was this uh, renegade. He would say what he wanted to say. Despite the controversy, or maybe thanks to it, as the new millennium approaches, Stern is syndicated in 60 markets with a peak audience of 20 million. 7% of the American population are listening to him on any given morning. But Stern's popularity has put him back in the crosshairs of an old enemy, the Federal Communications Commission. A war was set between Howard Stern, the company that paid him, and the United States of America. Howard Stern's broadcast companies were put in a position to have to start paying fines that were exorbitant in order to keep Howard on the air. And this fight and this tension started building and mounting over years. And when Stern ignores his boss's orders to tone it down, they come up with another solution to keep broadcasting. Howard's show began to be censored. They put somebody on a button, the dump button it was called. And Howard Stern's show could no longer be live. Howard Stern's show had to have that infamous delay. The general manager, Tom Chiasano, was now Howard's filter. I don't think it was uh, Tom's personal vendetta to go dump Howard. I I think it was orders from up above where he knew when the content got too sexual or too racial or too volatile, Tom had to use his big boy pants and be a boss and think, well, what is the government gonna think, you know? And by policing that, it made the show a little bit more interesting. You just didn't get to hear maybe things as descriptive as they were. I think the listeners felt cheated by not being able to hear that. It didn't turn them off from listening. It just made them more angry at Tom. Stern becomes increasingly frustrated with his boss's quick trigger finger on the dump button. These guys censor me whenever they... And, and, and I get a list every day of what they censor, and I sit there and I want to blow my brains out. Even though Howard Stern projects a very bombastic, risky type of an edgy DJ, really at heart, he doesn't want to be yanked off the air. He doesn't want to disappoint his listeners. So for Howard Stern, it was a very difficult time to navigate the control of the FCC. It's one of the darkest periods in Stern's life. At work, he's battling his bosses and the long arm of the U.S. government. At home, his singular obsession with work begins to destroy his relationship to the mother of his three kids. And their relationship appears to be falling apart on the air. You are abusive. You think you're the only one in the world. Uh, That's true. And you are not the only one in the world. Allison Stern will finally have enough. And Stern and his wife of 21 years will split for good. Overworked and stressed out, Stern is about to announce a decision that could destroy everything he's built. I turn over in bed, I look at my wife and I say, this is the end. She said, what do you mean? In the year of our Lord, 2004, I was given a job called Executive Producer of Special Programming, what was then called Infinity Broadcasting. Like most people in America, I woke up every morning at 6 o'clock and turned on The Howard Stern Show. For over 20 years, Howard Stern has defied the odds in his rise to become the king of morning radio. But in the early hours of October 6, 2004, Stern makes an announcement that rocks the American media landscape. He's leaving terrestrial radio to go to satellite. I turn over in bed, I look at my wife, and I say, this is the end. She said, what do you mean? I said, this is the end of Infinity Broadcasting. I get up that morning, I go into work, the place is in a panic. People are running around the hallways, freaking out. All hell has just broken loose. The move to Sirius is a massive long shot, but Stern frames it as a battle between good and evil. At 
2004, satellite radio has only been around for three years, and to listen, you have to buy a new device and pay for a new subscription. Howard joined Sirius when they were on the verge of extinction. It was something nobody really understood at the time. People were so confused by the whole thing. You know, it was a very big risk because it was an unproven medium. There was less than a million subscribers at the time, and, you know, who knew? Then you had the core group of people who were like, why are you making me pay for something that I got for free for X amount of years? Nobody really understood anything about it. Nobody knew how it worked. Um, you know, it was like this fantasy land of like, there's something in space that's gonna be beamed, but there's no FCC. I think that one of the biggest sells was just the uncensored nature of it, that there was no FCC interference, there were no restrictions. Stern's new deal gives him huge creative freedom, a giant pay raise, and a nationwide reach. But he's feeling the pressure. When I'm up at two o'clock in the morning and I'm sitting and creating these two new channels, there's a fire in me that says, oh my God, I can't disappoint that audience. As soon as he showed up, I think I remember they were at like 300,000 subscribers at Sirius. When he announced, announced he was coming over, they shot up to over 700,000. I mean, they were over a million before he, he set foot in that building. Uh, it, it, was, it was huge. Launch day 2006, and Stern is up at the crack of dawn, pushing himself to make his dream of sensor-free radio a reality. Almost instantly, his staff can feel the shackles are off. I felt like that organic, spontaneous nature of the show, the first five, six, seven years on Sirius, it, it was cranked up to 11. We're bouncing off a satellite in the sky. We don't have the FCC. Let's go. Howard had came, come up with a bit to get High Pitch Eric uh, to bet on the amount of times, weight, and total weight of how many times Eric would shit in 24 hours, and they called it the craptacular. And they were doing all kinds of prop bets. Would Eric shit more than a raccoon in 24 hours, a baby elephant, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. And I watched this newsroom, everybody look around as if this is a prank. Like, they're like, well, is he kidding? I, I'm Emmy nominated. I'm supposed to weigh shit. And as a comic and a super fan of the show, I was in the room going, this is history in the making. The high pitch Eric craptacular is, is definitely an event that I want to erase from my memory. So thank you to the show for bringing that back up. Seemed to be okay with this being a pirate ship. There was shit happening on the air that you would have never thought was gonna happen on the Stern show. Stern's bold move pays off for him and Sirius. Their subscriptions increased by a whopping four million. Sirius wouldn't be around if it wasn't for Howard. He was the only guy that could put that product on the map. He saved the satellite radio industry single-handedly, without a doubt. But soon, Stern's relentless drive to go big would propel him to make another radical move. And once again, he'll risk it all. By the 2000s, Howard Stern has established himself as the number one host on satellite radio, but he's not content to rest on his success. Stern surprises everyone when he signs on as a judge on one of the most popular series on TV. He's welcomed by the show's celebrity hosts. You see sides of him that you've never seen before. He ab absolutely is compassionate, emotional, edgy, and honest. America's Got Talent even relocates its entire production from L.A. to New York to accommodate their new star. But Stern's Main Street move risks putting everything he's done in the past under a microscope. It was like really shocking to me. America's Got Talent is such a family-friendly show. It's like, whoa. You are a true original, and I think we are what we're looking for. I think all the risks he took throughout the years on radio and with bits, he could calculate those risks ahead of time. The America's Got Talent audience could have easily rejected him just by going back to and looking at his past. And NBC took a chance because there definitely could have been some pushback, people canceling Howard or canceling the show. Howard took a risk with his audience. They could have seen it like he was selling out. So now he's, he's mainstream. He became America's sweetheart. He got a taste of 
that network mainstream soccer moms know your name now celebrities are watching you on TV now that, that and they like you I think that injection of that uh, was a big factor in the changes that came later with the radio show. Stern's primetime television debut introduces him to a new generation of younger fans, but many of them have no clue about his X-rated past. How do you explain to an eight-year-old uh, what anal ring toss is, or why are you throwing baloney at a stripper's ass? You know, I, I guess maybe that's when possibly he had to start to adjust. As his star rises on TV, the man once known as the King of Misfits begins reshaping his radio show and his own image. That's when you knew internally on the staff that things were about to change and there was something going on here, that it was either a rebrand or him just trying to sanitize himself. In this leaked internal presentation to his staff, Everything. an angry Stern lays when out how he wants things to change. I was up till 2, 3 in the morning every night because I was so pissed that we're not doing this shit. When this whole corporate shift happened, it became, you know, much more by the book. Everybody's afraid of what management's going to say. And there'll be accountability, which I think is probably the most important thing I want to get across today. It doesn't matter your bike's not real or it doesn't have a chain on it and you're not actually going, but everybody's got to pedal. To put people in charge that aren't necessarily aware of what they're in charge of is, is not great for the business, it's not great for morale. Everything has to be checked and rechecked 17 different times, you know, and by the time it gets to the air, there's no, there's no writer on earth that can make that shit funny. Um, sometimes you just gotta let shit happen. You gotta, you gotta let it breathe. And there was so much policing going on, everything from dress codes to, to uh, material that, uh, you know, I'm like, shit, I don't know, I don't know what to do here. As Stern begins cleaning up the content on his Syria show, porn stars are replaced by his favorite A-list celebrities. I think his uh, friendships in Hollywood had, has a lot to do with him kind of saying goodbye to this old way of doing things. The problem is suddenly you've got a house in the Hamptons, and suddenly the establishment you were making fun of is over for a dinner party. Before you know it, you are what you were making fun of. I discovered that there was that there really was a change, and Howard had changed a lot, and he had become politically far more liberal, far more careful. And I think this was partly because of the changing times, and it was a very astute decision, but also I think he himself changed as a person. I guess he just, he got a lot less fun. And people around him noticed that. If you've done something a certain way for so long, and then you do, and then you start doing it in a much different way, um, yeah, you you run a risk of of pissing off all those people. Howard Stern made a career out of breaking the rules and not caring what anyone thinks. But he's about to turn on an old friend and risk losing what's left of his famously loyal fan base. He picked up the phone and he called me personally, and he asked me if I would go to the uh, Republican convention and endorse him. January 20th, 2017, Howard Stern's old friend has just been sworn in as the leader of the free world. Over his dozens of appearances on The Howard Stern Show, Trump and Stern developed a bond that extended beyond the studio. Howard has known Trump for a long, long time, and I, I think they were genuinely friends in the 90s. I don't think it was just Howard was doing a bit and secretly made fun of him. I think they were genuinely friends, and certainly Trump thought they were genuinely friends. At his wedding, um, he always like spoke so highly of him. Uh, he was friends, they did stuff off the air. But as Stern watched Trump campaign and then win the presidency, he's disgusted by what he sees. Fast forward to, you know, political Howard and just how insanely crazy he was over Trump and still is. Stern turns on his old friend. He called me personally and he asked me if I would go to the uh, Republican convention and endorse him. And I was like, oh gosh, you know, for about a split second, I went, can you imagine if I was all in? It's another bold move. Stern is becoming unrecognizable to his hardcore fans. 
people are allowed to evolve. You may not be crazy about it, but they're allowed to. Stern once told 60 Minutes he would never burn his audience, but his transformation into an outspoken liberal risked alienating the last of his old school listeners once and for all. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. Now, you know who used to be a frequent guest on the Howard Stern Show, but Stern gave a blunt message to his listeners. The oddity in all of this is the people Trump despises most love him the most. Go look at Mar-a-Lago, see if there's any people that look like you. His main core audience, the guys that are driving in cars, driving in trucks, you know, breaking their ass, listening to him in traffic, they're kind of on Trump's side. And I think they feel like abandoned and turned. They don't want to hear it. He is now he went from being a bad boy uh, to becoming uh, Hillary Clinton's buddy. Like all of a sudden it just hits you in the face and it's like, holy shit, this sucks so hard. And he's been standing for free speech forever and Howard's just kind of like rich and irrelevant and stands for nothing now. And but for me, it's heartbreaking. It would honestly be like if today at like 11 o'clock, uh, some story came out that Bruce Springsteen was a f raised by two millionaires and he had a great relationship with his father. I have a lot of friends who are diehard Howard people. He'd say, John, it's not the same Howard. It's, oh, he's so, he's, he's woke, he's liberal. It's not, he's not fun anymore. I don't think he assessed that risk properly. If you're gonna pick a side, then don't be pissed that the other side isn't, isn't going with you anymore. That's it. You painted yourself into that corner. You know, it's like when Forrest Gump just stopped running. Now all these schmucks are in the middle of the desert going, well, why the f did I follow you out here now? Even as longtime listeners leave him behind, Stern doubles down on his crusade against Trump. Imagine you got to be the 45th president of the United States, and you're sitting and writing about Howard Stern. Why devote your whole goddamn show to that world? And, and my thing is like, if we're gonna bust Trump's balls, then we should bust Biden's balls. But that wasn't, that wasn't the case. That just wasn't, it wasn't gonna happen. He, he wanted to make sure that Trump uh, was, was defeated. Howard Stern has changed, but will this final gamble pay off? I think Howard's just one of those guys where he goes, this is what I do and this is how I'm gonna do it. And you're not gonna tell me what to do. Stern's liberal turn shocks conservative outlets like Fox and Friends. Shock jock, Howard Stern is embracing his woke side. If woke means I can't get behind Trump, which is what I think it means, or that I support people who want to be transgender or I'm for the vaccine, dude, call me woke as you want. March 2020, the world comes to a standstill, but Howard Stern is in his element. He was a germphobe before the pandemic. Now, I mean, forget it. I think uh, the pandemic made a dream come true for Howard in one way, whereas he doesn't have to leave his house now. He can be in his pajamas, put his slippers on, walk downstairs, hit the on-air switch, and, and he's broadcasting from home. Oh, Stern begins broadcasting from his basement in suburban New York. Up these doors. When are we gonna stop putting up with the idiots in this country and just say, you now, it's mandatory to get vaccinated. F them, f their freedom. I want my freedom to live. Howard Stern's entire career was based on saying what's on his mind, even if it meant hurting everyone around him. Stern's eldest daughter even comes forward to say his years of objectifying women had been traumatic for her growing up. But as he approaches his fifth decade on the air, he looks in the mirror and doesn't like the man he sees. The Howard Stern of today is a much different person than the Howard Stern of the 90s. He's far more reflective. It's as if he doesn't worry about getting listeners anymore. And he started to reconcile a lot of the things that he did in the past. It's as if he wants to correct the record in a sense. Stern even begins seeing a therapist and goes on an apology tour to celebrities he's maligned in the past. On David Letterman's Netflix show, Stern reveals the pain of his youth and tries to make amends. I was just a young man full of rage, and I was angry. I painted that uh, for your wife. Yes. Because I felt bad, I had said some things, and again, words had no meaning to me. 
It all has people wondering, did Howard Stern evolve his radio personality to avoid the wrath of cancel culture? Or did Howard Stern, the man, abandon his audience for his new celebrity status? Howard Stern is almost a master of it now is because he can admit what he did was wrong. It was a different time. He knows now he would never do it again. And people believe him. I think at this point in his career, his kids are older. Uh, as a father, I get it. It's kind of creepy. The old dude asking about anal, you know. Look, he's been doing it forever. I mean, it could very well be he's just sick of it. <laughs> you know, maybe not what the core wants, but what he wants. Stern even welcomes on Hillary Clinton, who so many of his fans considered the epitome of the liberal coastal elite he used to poke fun of. Good to see you. Good this is you. so exciting for me. One thing's for sure, Howard Stern is not you going to let anyone tell him what to say, say or Donald do, point to just right. like he always has. <laughs> He signs a new deal with Sirius worth over a hundred million a year, retaining his title as the highest paid host in radio. The deal will allow Stern the freedom to do what he loves most. Howard Stern is a tremendously talented interviewer. You don't you know fantasize what? about a great love affair? I, I got, I've got a great love affair with my kids right now. Everybody uh, loves Howard's interviews and they are next level and he's phenomenal. Um, at these interviews. Everybody's got a podcast right now. Nobody would have a podcast if it wasn't for Howard. Howard's job is to sit and bring things out of you. So now this is front of like five cast members, me and Tracy Moore. Tracy Moore like, yo, Jim, this is gonna get hot. Uh, comedian Jim Brewer and yeah, I got to do Howard Stern multiple times. He gives you the space to do your thing. Howard would laugh so hard. He gave me the greatest money. He would, I'd look at him, his mouth was facing straight up in the air. His mouth would be like that. And it was genuine. Stern still commands a huge audience of loyal listeners. Even the people who say they're done with Stern forever, they're secretly still listening. Um, and in that respect, he has a cult of personality around him still that, kind of like Trump. So I would never count Howard Stern out. As long as he wants to keep interviewing and keep working, there will always be a place for Howard Stern in our society. Of all the people I've ever worked with in radio, Howard Stern is the most brave. Howard Stern is the singular king of fearlessness. I don't even want to think what my life would be like if I was not on Howard. I don't even want to think about where I would be right now. No one will ever duplicate what that man did. No one will ever make as many stars out of people who should never be stars. Hell, you're watching me. I'm a, I'm a nothing. But thanks to that guy, I'm sitting here.